Hey everyone, I am Dan Stamkowski, better known as Artosis, and I've been playing RTS games competitively for more than 20 years now. For the past 12 years, I've lived in South Korea as a professional commentator for StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2. And while I'm much more known for the StarCraft series, I'm kind of a fan of RTS games overall in general. I generally end up trying pretty much every RTS that comes out. And to be honest, most of them I find quite lacking. That being said, today I want to talk about a game that I quite like, and that's Spellforce 3. So, what makes Spellforce 3 such an interesting RTS game? Well, let me try to sum it up kind of as basically as I can. First off, there's six races, which is quite a, quite a bit for a, a good RTS game to have. I think really only Age of Empires goes uh, high and then higher than that. Uh, but in this game, we have elves, orcs, humans, trolls, dwarves, and dark elves. And they definitely all have their own way to be played. Uh, they have different emphases for sure uh, and feel different both to play and to play against. So that's kind of cool that they, they don't just feel like uh, carbon copies of one another. Uh, next up is the economy. The economy is actually pretty darn complex. Uh, you actually get five different resources per race, uh, and they aren't all the same. Like, for instance, everyone's going to get wood and stone and food but after that, you're going to kind of have some unique ways in which you're gathering some resources that the other races don't utilize as much. Uh, you also might have a race that uses more of something. For instance, uh, the elves really use a lot of trees. Uh, so that kind of makes it a little bit more complex as well. Uh, another thing that I find really interesting about the economy that I'm a real big fan of is the way that you expand and the way that workers are handled. So each area uh, where you can expand to has this little place where you make a banner and then you can upgrade that uh, into, I, what do we call it, a town hall, a command center, whatever you might want to call it from whatever game you're from. Uh, and that is going to allow you to get more workers there, which auto make, but you only get a certain number of workers per area, uh, per the level of the building <laughs> that runs the area. So it makes spreading your economy out uh, both very important and very strategic. I think that uh, it also reminds me quite a bit of the original Dawn of War, actually, where you would have to go around and take different parts of the map. It was really an integral part of the game, and I kind of get that feel here as well. So it feels like uh, the Spellforce 3 is taking uh, economic ideas from more than one other RTS, and they actually fit together very, very well within this game. My method to become good at a new RTS game, I've used uh, basically the same core ideas, although over the years, of course, I've become better at refining these and putting them into practice a lot more quickly, a lot more efficiently, uh, but I've used it to great effect uh, to reach high-level tournament play and uh, all sorts of RTS games from Pear World to Age of Empires 3, uh, StarCraft 2, of course, when it came out. I uh, used it in Tooth and Tail as well. Uh, and now I'm using it in Spellforce. And the idea behind this is to kind of study the economy a little bit, figure out, okay, what does this actually do? How do I actually produce? How many buildings do you actually need? How many workers? What are you looking at with that? Uh, and starting at the very basic building blocks of trying to be aggressive. You simply learn more in an RTS game from being aggressive early on. You learn uh, how to manage very small bits of the economy, how to continually put on pressure. And while your opponent is defending, you're actually kind of learning how to defend as well because you're seeing what's working against you and what's not working against you. Uh, this is going to give you a lot stronger early game and allow you more play on the ladder. Even if you want to be a defensive macro player, which honestly is what I'm known for, it's oftentimes much better to begin by rushing. 
So here I'm going to show you just a little bit of footage uh, from after. I mean, I started playing the game, uh, you know, a little bit on the ladder, a little bit against PCs and things like that. Uh, but once I decided that I really wanted to take it a bit more seriously, I jumped into single player. I went ahead, chose the weakest AI, one that doesn't really attack you or anything, and just kind of sat there and observed. Uh, one of the very first things I did was to create a couple hunting huts, see what that food intake looks like. Started writing down the numbers for build times for things, uh, such as smashers, uh, and tried to calculate, okay, uh, how do I get constant production of these early game units? Uh, you know, for instance, a smasher, it takes 50 seconds to, to make. Uh, it costs 12 food and has six supplies. So to make these nonstop, you need about two hunting huts. It's not a perfect exact uh, number. Sometimes you're going to have little tiny dips where the smasher uh, slows down in its making, pauses for a moment while you wait for more food to come in, but it's very close to that. Uh, and from there, of course, I kept mapping more and more. For instance, how much does a farm produce? Well, it's about half as good as a hunting hut. So if I need two hunting huts to make smashers nonstop, looks like I need about four farms. Definitely not as good, but it's renewable. So good to know. Some of the other early things that I wanted to measure were just resource uh, gathering rates, how much the various buildings cost, how long they take to make. Uh, how does the supply work? How do we expand our supply? When do we need to su expand our supply? For instance, uh, you know, when you're making a, a smasher, if you don't have enough supply for it, it'll get to 99% and sit there. So when exactly do I need to make, uh, you know, a, a, a new supply enhancing building? Those types of things are really, really important so that you can just play fluidly when you enter the ladder. So now I have this kind of base of knowledge. How do I continually make the first tier units? How do I expand? How much does everything cost? What do we do from here? Well, I skipped really learning about resources number four and five because that's when you go up the tech tree a bit more uh, and instead jumped right on the ladder with my newfound powers of being able to make tier one units nonstop. And already this was a great help. While before I was just kind of running around the map uh, willy-nilly on the ladder, you know, winning some games, losing some games, but not really knowing why. Here I just applied pressure every single game, ran around, expanded as I could, got as much food as possible, made as many smashes as possible, and attacked my opponents. Of course, some games where I play against a great veteran player, they're going to be able to take me out, but overall... Uh, definitely added some solidity and showed me where I needed to go to next. And that, of course, was up the tech tree. All right, so we're going up the tech tree now. Well, I don't want to go all the way up the tech tree, just to <laughs> make that very, very clear. We want to go up just a little tiny bit. We know what the very first units are. What are the units that come right afterwards? Well... For trolls, uh, I went ahead and took a look at throwers, skull crushers, and spike flingers. Basically wrote down all their costs, all their stats, took a look at what they did, made some against the computer, and tried to figure out, okay, which units here are the stronger ones and which are the weaker? Uh, for me personally, I pretty quickly came to the realization that spike flingers are ridiculously awesome. They have great range. They do some splash damage. And throwers a little bit less so. They're ranged, yeah, sure, but the range isn't all that good. So, yeah, we are now looking at trying to get some spike flingers. Well, that means we have to add on getting some scrap metal. That's all right, though. <laughs> it's time to start working on build orders. All right, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, just steady... Uh, building of the smashers, having the resources to do that, knowing when to expand my supply, that gave me a big skill jump. Uh, immediately realized that on the ladder was playing a lot better, uh, having some much closer games. The build orders really helped with that as well. First thing up, how much, uh, how many starting resources do you receive? Well, 52 wood, 52 stone, 10 food with trolls. Uh, so I took a look, like, what exactly 
can we end up affording with that, right? And so I start writing down some build orders. Well, you know what? We start with four workers. What are the first four buildings that we should be building? Well, at first I was toying around with maybe getting smashers right off the bat, but realized that that wasn't working out too well. You have to wait uh, for the hunting huts to finish and then deliver a couple more food before your first smasher even pops out. It's just kind of slow. It slows down your expansion. So let's forget about that. Uh, instead, I came up with, uh, okay, let's go a couple woods and a couple stones right off the bat. The fifth worker, let's get some wood with that as well because we're going to have some extra stone uh, to buy that extra uh, tree chopper with. And then let's expand. You know, you already have a hero out walking on the map. Let's let's get another base up. Let's get more workers out there and, and more resources to gather from. And honestly, that fit together perfectly. Wood, wood, stone, stone, wood, expand. And from there, you know, things start to roll in. You can start doing things like adding those hunting huts and in, in producing units. And this, just these small things put together, how many buildings do I need to be able to constantly produce this? And then how do I fit these buildings in an order that makes sense is a huge benefit when you start new, playing a new game. And of course, this can be done with absolutely any race in Spellforce and truly with any RTS game. In fact, uh, I really do recommend that this is how people start to play an, a new RTS if you want to be good, uh, because it's going to save you a lot of time, give you a nice strong base to build off of. Remember, if you want to be successful at anything in life, and this, of course, includes RTS games, strong fundamentals are the key to moving forward.